Thank you, Fiona. Good evening. Welcome to Monday's Look North. Here's what's on the programme tonight. The Prime Minister confirms high-speed rail will come to Bradford. It would mean a new station and Manchester just half an hour away. But when will it happen? We speak live to the leader of Bradford Council. Also tonight... Disruption and inconvenience for passengers as bus services around the region face further cuts. The cutting us off. We're having no transport on a night and turning us hourly, we cannot get anywhere. Where we need to get, you can't go. It's received billions in green energy subsidies, but now a BBC investigation reveals Drax Power Station is burning wood from forests in Canada. And a rise Dame Ian, acting royalty Sir Ian McKellen, talks about his pantomime plan in Sheffield. And it's a mild start to the week, but we do have some wind and rain to come. I'll be back later in the programme with all the very latest. Good evening. It's been a day of U-turns from the government. Hours after the Chancellor scrapped plans for a tax cut for higher earners, the Prime Minister confirmed a new high-speed rail line for the North will stop at Bradford. Last year, the government rejected proposals for a new route, which would have halved journey times from Bradford to Manchester. They decided to focus on this, an upgrade of the existing routes between York and Manchester via Leeds and Huddersfield, and costing £11 billion. Now, that is still due to go ahead. But today, Liz Truss committed to a full new high-speed line between Liverpool and Hull, with Bradford at the centre of the plans. The cost could be more than £20 billion, although few details have been released on that yet. Corin Wheatley is in Bradford for us this evening, where I'm sure this news has been really welcomed. Corin. Good evening, Amy. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, it looks like Bradford is back on the map for Northern Powerhouse Rail. Uh, the question over Bradford's inclusion on this high-speed route between Liverpool and Hull has been so important because it's uh, previously been named as having the worst rail connections of any major British city. We're in the in interchange at the moment, one of two city centre stations, but they're both at the end of branch routes. And from here, connection times uh, can be pretty poor, especially to places like Manchester. Manchester. Well, Liz Truss said during the leadership contest uh, that she committed to Northern Powerhouse Rail in full. Today, she made it clear that Bradford would get a new station on that line. So let's get some reaction now from Susan Hinchcliffe, the leader of Bradford Council. Uh, Susan, you've heard this promise about Northern Powerhouse Rail and Bradford's new station before. How confident are you that this time it will stick? It's a positive announcement and I have always believed that it's just common sense to invest in Bradford. If any government, whatever political party, wants to invest in the growth of this economy in this country, then Bradford is the place to do it. We're the youngest city in the country, we're globally connected, we're right in the heart of, all, heart of the north of England, 540,000 people. What is there not to invest in here? It's a good proposition. And uh, talk us through uh, timescales. I know, you know, uh, they, rode, they rode back on Bradford's inclusion scale back the plans last year, but you originally had a vision for how this would work. Uh, how do you see it working? Do we know yet about the timescale? And we didn't stop working on our proposition, so we've kept developing it in the meantime. We've got development frameworks out that we're working on now to show how things can be delivered. And we know that the station site we've selected, which is St James's, can be delivered within less than 10 years. So that's the kind of pace we're working at. We just need to now work with network rail, with government, Department of Transport, to make sure we all get together and deliver this as quickly as possible. It's good for Bradford, it's good for the rest of the north of England. Thanks very much, Susan. Well, uh, this has been uh, welcomed by a number of other organisations. Let's hear now from Henry Murison from the Northern Powerhouse Partnership. I think it's really welcome that the Prime Minister has recommitted to Northern Powerhouse Rail, but we've obviously had commitments from previous Prime Ministers to this project, and, and sadly they haven't then come to what we hoped for. So I will be working along with business leaders, along with uh, the Metro Mayor in West Yorkshire, with Susan Hinchcliffe, to turn these warm words into reality. Well, so a cautious uh, welcome there. Uh, although lots of people have long memories, they do remember the last time that uh, a new Prime Minister made this same promise about, Northern, the, about the Northern Powerhouse Rail project. Uh, we've contacted the government for more details today. They just say that uh, uh, there'll be more information uh, in due course. Corinne, thank you.
So welcome news there for rail commuters. We're going to stay with transport now because it's not such good news for those who use the bus. Further cuts to bus services across our region are taking effect this week. Since the pandemic, hundreds of routes have been withdrawn or run a reduced frequency. The bus company Ariba says falling passenger numbers and rising costs mean some routes have become economically unviable. Our transport correspondent Spencer Stokes has this. Waiting for a bus in Worrell. Pre-COVID, this Sheffield village had a number 57 service three times an hour. It was going to be cancelled completely from today, but in a last-minute change of heart, Stagecoach announced it will continue to operate, although information is sparse. So the first thing you notice is the timetable's out of date, effective from the 24th of July, but services have changed this weekend. The times, though, haven't done. And it's the same with the app, saying there isn't a bus running, recommending passengers walk two miles to another stop. Terrell relies on the service to get her daughter to school. Right up until Friday, we were told different stories. My neighbour was told by stagecoach and then by a bus driver that Saturday was the last day. So we have no idea where we are. Obviously, I've got all the elderly asking me do we have a bus on Monday because they need to get to hospital appointments and stuff and they obviously can't figure out apps and things and as we've found today, the app doesn't give us much information anyway. Stagecoach say the bus timetable is on their website and after a short wait, it arrives. So despite local fears, Worrell still has a bus for the time being. Passenger numbers have not recovered since the pandemic. I think we're on about 70%. Um, so really, uh, it is the case that that bus route is not as viable as it was before. Bus services in rural areas are absolutely crucial. We have to see them continue. Uh, and so I suppose my message to, to people is please use these buses. Urban areas have also been affected by today's service reductions. In Scholes near Clackheaton, an Arriva bus is cut from half hourly to hourly. Arriva blame reduced passenger numbers and increased operating costs. But it leaves Betty and Dawn isolated. I can't go anywhere. I don't drive. Never have done. Uh, if I want to go for my flu jab, I need a bus. Uh, Covid jabs due. I can't make an appointment just at the minute because I don't know what's happening with the buses. Fares in West Yorkshire have been cut by the mayor, but she doesn't want to see services go in the same direction. I can't tell you how frustrated and angry I am with Arriva and First, but it can't be right that they will cherry pick the great routes that then give them a profit. And we, as a combined authority, basically the public have to pay for the routes that they don't want. It's not fair and it's not right. And that's why I am looking at um, franchising and public control very seriously and we'll be making that decision before too long. For so many customers, bus travel feels like a lottery, not knowing if a service will survive. A situation made worse by the pandemic. Spencer's here now. I think many will have sympathy with Betty, who's really isolated without those bus services. Uh, what have the company said and what have the government said on this? Yeah, all the bus companies saying that they're facing a number of problems at the moment. Since the pandemic, passenger numbers falling, fuel costs rising and wage inflation as well, partly because of inflation, but also because of the recruitment crisis in the industry. So they say that where a service isn't economically viable, they struggle to justify running it. The government has pumped 130 30 million into bus companies across the country for the next six months after the pandemic. That's to keep services running. They also say they expect bus companies to inform local communities where services are being cut. I think some people in Worrell today will feel that didn't happen there. That is perhaps because that service cut was reversed at the last minute last week. So some communication problems in that part of Sheffield. Let's go back to the train. Our top mm. story, announcement that high-speed rail will go through Bradford. How significant is that announcement? It's a big government U-turn, another, another mm. U-turn, a phrase we've heard a lot of yeah. today, Amy. Last December, the Transport Secretary Grant Shapps cancelled that plan. He said it didn't make sense to build a new railway through Bradford, a new railway station, when billions was already being invested in the Transpennine upgrade from York to Huddersfield and on to Manchester on that route. So he said they would focus on that and leave Bradford out of the upgrade plans. Today, we get a complete U-turn. 
Bradford is going to be part of the upgrade. It will go all the way from Liverpool through to Hull. Interestingly, it takes us back to where we were with George Osborne, five chances of the Exchequer ago when he wanted to build that cross rail for the North. And we now have a leader of the opposition and a prime minister committing to Bradford on Northern Powerhouse Rail. I remember those commitments very well five years ago. Spencer, thank you. Let's hope it happens. Next tonight, the company that runs Drax Power Station is cutting down some of the world's most precious forests, despite receiving billions of pounds in green energy subsidies. That's according to a BBC Panorama investigation. Drax near Selby generates electricity by burning wood pellets. Now, the company says it only takes sawdust and waste wood that the timber industry can't use. Joe Crowley reports. The Drax power station in Yorkshire generates 12% of the UK's renewable energy. It's been given £6 billion in green energy subsidies. The company says its wood pellets meet stringent sustainability standards. But that's not always true. Take the primary forests of Western Canada. They're vital in the fight against climate change because they store vast amounts of carbon. Panorama has discovered Drax cut this one down. It's really a shame that British taxpayers are funding this destruction with their money. Logging natural forests and converting them into pellets to be burned for electricity, that is absolutely insane. There's no other word for it. Drax says it didn't use the wood and the site will be replanted. But there are thousands of logs at its pellet plants. We wanted to find out if they're coming from primary forests. So we followed a logging truck for 60 miles. There are very, very, very fresh tire prints. So we're still on its tail. When we stop and send up a drone, it's clear that trees have been felled in this primary forest. And we can see the lorry being loaded. We then follow the logs back to Drax's pellet plant. We know these have come from a primary forest and now they're destined to be made into pellets. You can see, welcome to Drax Meadowbank. Drax admitted it had taken logs from this site and said they were tree species the timber industry didn't want. The company claimed both sites weren't primary forests because they were near roads. But both sites appear to meet the UN definitions of primary forest. And our evidence shows the company is breaking its public promise to avoid damaging them. Joe Crowley, BBC News. Looks like a compelling match, that, doesn't it? You can watch the full story on Panorama on BBC One tonight at 8 o'clock and also on the BBC iPlayer after that. You're watching Monday's Look North, still to come on tonight's programme. How hundreds of families from across Yorkshire joined together to remember loved ones who died from suicide. Health experts are urging people to take up the offer of an autumn booster COVID vaccine. Latest data from the Office for National Statistics show that infection rates here in Yorkshire and the Humber are once again on the rise. The jabs are being rolled out to those most at risk of COVID. Our health correspondent Jimmy Coulson reports. At this pharmacy in Normanton, the rollout of autumn boosters is well underway, with those deemed most at risk from COVID being invited by the NHS to top up their protection. I just think it's important to stop the, the outbreak and the spread that we witnessed in the first outbreak where people lost their lives. It's just important to protect ourselves and protect everybody else. It means we can go about our normal lives um, knowing we've done what we can do. I don't want to get COVID because um, my stepfather died of it and a lot of people died of it haven't they, over years. So over a couple of years, so I'll just make sure I get it so I'm, I'm, I keep fit and healthy really. People here are being offered the new bivalent vaccine, which offers higher levels of antibody protection against some strains of Omicron, though the NHS say the previous vaccines still offer good protection. Autumn boosters are being offered to those in the highest risk groups first, but those eligible will eventually include everyone over 50, care home residents, pregnant women, carers and the families of those with weakened immune systems, people with certain underlying health conditions and frontline health and social care workers. The NHS is inviting people to come forward when it's their turn. 
some people who've had the COVID vaccine in, in, in the past, it begins to, to the, the immunity starts to uh, lessen. And therefore, it's important that just because you've had the COVID vaccine before, if you are eligible to have it, again, take, take your, take your uh, opportunity to have it. The autumn rollout comes at a time when COVID rates are on the rise once again. The latest data from the Office for National Statistics suggests that while here in Yorkshire and the Humber rates are lower than they were in the summer, they are now moving in the wrong direction, with around one in 60 people infected. There is certainly a threat, not just from COVID this winter, but also of flu. And if we were to have both flu and COVID striking at the same time, um, first, firstly, it could um, have a huge impact on, uh, on workplaces, on schools, on hospitals. But also, if someone has both infections at the same time, uh, that's pretty bad news. As we enter the colder months, COVID will continue to pose a threat. But experts say boosters will offer the best protection for those who need it most. Jamie Coulson, BBC Look North. Let's move on now to the UK's first nuclear fusion power plant that will be built near Retford in Nottinghamshire. We've got this long wait as it's going to take two decades to become operational, but West Burton Power Station will become home to what could be the world's first prototype commercial nuclear fusion reactor. This type of energy generation has only ever been done in experiments so far, but could provide an almost limitless source of clean energy. Bereavement families have come together to remember loved ones lost to suicide. They've helped to create a huge quilt that will be displayed across Yorkshire. It's part of a wider project called Speak Their Name, which aims to offer support and raise awareness of suicide prevention. Abigiola has been speaking to some of the people involved. Every square represents someone who was loved and lost to suicide. It was months in the making, time to remember and reflect. There are almost 200 personalised tributes on the panels here. Behind everyone, a grieving family. You live with guilt. You live with what ifs, why. And every morning you wake up, it's the first thing you see. Every night you close your eyes and it's the last thing you see. And you know that you have to live with that for the rest of your days. I'm here to talk about my son, Josh. My son, Dean. Zach, my daughter, The group Alex. have also made a film to share their stories and raise awareness of suicide prevention. They came together not just to make this quilt, but to talk and heal. We all have that common denominator which ties us all together and we take part in weekly zoom meetings and things like that and it, it's it's just been a very cathartic experience it has helped us to talk to each other about what's happened within the family and what and with leo and when we've met other people a part of the group being able to share those stories without fear of uh, being judged or stigma attached. Creating this quilt has been a massive emotional journey for all of us involved in the room. Karen is one of the founder members of the Speak Their Name project. She lost her husband Ian and her daughter Bethany to suicide. Because when you see that quilt and look at those squares and see the, the loss and the love that's in that, if it helps somebody prevent, uh, prevent them taking their own life, then that's really important. But it's also a message of hope as well, I think, because it's when you look at that, that quilt, every single square is completely different. But we are different as human beings. When nobody, none of us are perfect. None of those squares are perfect. But they've been created with love, and that's all that matters, really. The quilt will now be displayed across Yorkshire to help spread the message there is hope and there is help. Abby Jayola, BBC Look North. It's such an important message to get out there. If you or someone you know has been affected by the issues raised in tonight's report, you can contact the BBC Action Line via bbc.co.uk forward slash action line for details of organisations which offer support and advice. Now, do you fancy seeing one of Britain's most famous actors and one of its most famous comedians on stage in Sheffield? Oh, yes, you do. Ian McKellen, everybody. <laughs> 
There he is. Sir Ian McKellen has announced he's stepping into a frock to play the lead role in a touring production of Mother Goose and he'll be joined by John Bishop. You'll have to wait until next February, next year, to see the show at the City's Lyceum Theatre. The pair were asked how they viewed the prospect of being on the road together for such a long time. The whole cast and crew are making a commitment to be together for a whole six months, five months on the road, a month rehearsal. That's a big deal. Hmm. And so you've got to have some, some chemistry. I may not survive. <laughs> <laughs> They'll be calling on Derek Jacobin. <laughs> Derek, we've got a problem, love. Um, yeah. But Panto. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, we can't sell the pants. Oh, come and watch it. Ian might not make it. <laughs> Ian or Derek. Yeah. Ian or Derek. I will make it. I'll be there. Even if you got to carry me on, I'll be there. Exactly. Oh, and so will I, and if you're in it, fabulous line up there. Keely's here now with the weather. Nice pumpkins. Well, thank you very much. Yes, it's feeling rather autumnal, although mm -hmm. very mild out there. I've got some lovely pictures to show you of sunrise this morning. Uh, loads of them uh, coming in. Uh, sunrise over Rotherham Minster, that's our first picture. The second, uh, a lovely sunrise at Caton Bay. And the third over Winterset Reservoir, lovely uh, red colours. You know what they say, red sky in the morning, shepherd's warning. And that's true because we do have uh, some rain waiting in the wings in the west, uh, windy conditions conditions as well at times this week. You can keep your pictures coming in to the BBC Weather Watchers page or you can tweet me. I'm on Instagram to keely.donovan. So yes, some unsettled weather to come this week. We've got rain on the cars, which is good news for some. Uh, but we've also got very windy weather and uh, an early warning for the strength of those winds across parts of North Yorkshire at the moment, the risk of gales or severe gales. Tomorrow, uh, it will be breezy. It'll start off on a fine note, but quite quickly cloud over and then rain will spread southeastwards through the course of the day. And then further spells of rain at times this week, but it is Wednesday. You can see a kink in the ice bars. It's Wednesday. We're expecting gales or severe gales. And then it remains quite breezy and blustery towards the end of the week. Thursday, not too bad, but another band of rain uh, to greet us early morning on Friday. So we started off with some sunshine, as we saw from the, the pictures, uh, but it did cloud over through the course of the day. There's a lot of cloud out there at the moment, but the cloud will tend to thin and break at times as we head through this evening and overnight. It'll be a fine and settled night, and it will also be quite a mild one as well, with temperatures dropping back to around 11 or 12 degrees. Let's take a quick look at those high water times then. The next one in Filey at 11.58, 11.38 in Scarborough. So we'll start the morning, if you're up and about early doors, with some sunshine for central and eastern parts quite quickly, as you can see, clouding over. Rain moving in and spreading southeastwards through the course of the day. So rain at times through the afternoon, more especially uh, across the hills. And it will be quite blustery, nowhere near as windy as it will be on Wednesday, though. But temperatures getting up to around 17 or 18 degrees, so above average for the time of year. Those winds picking up the risk of gales or severe gales at times on Wednesday. Outbreaks of rain which could be heavy over the hills to start the day, clearing to sunshine and heavy blustery showers for the afternoon. On Thursday a dry day, still one or two showers for the west, uh, but some sunshine further east. And then on Friday another band of rain, early doors, and as you can see it cools down again as we head towards the weekend. Amy. Nice to have you back Keely. Thank you. <laughs> That's it from us. We'll see you at half ten. Bye bye.